So Martha's introduction basically summarized my first slide, so I, I shaved an extra minute off of my talk. I'm grateful. I'm going to use that time. David talked about the importance of interdisciplinary work. I want to just very quickly introduce our interdisciplinary team who's here with me today. Susan Cole, who you heard Martha mention, is the director of our project. Ann Eisner, a row back, is our deputy director. Katie Ryan, staff attorney. Colleen Armstrong is our lead organizer and project coordinator. And Alex Horn is our program administrator. I'm the one today who has the privilege to stand up here and share our ideas with you, but I hope during the question and answer period they'll jump in and join the conversation. So here's what I want to try to do in my eight, nine minutes. Um, I wanted to briefly introduce you to our project, but that's what Martha did, so I can do that very quickly. Then what I want to do is summarize the five core ideas that animate our work every day toward achieving the mission which Martha um, um, laid out for you, which is, this is the collaboration part, this is the mission part, and I'll say just a few more words about the work that we do every day. So first, through our education law clinic here at the law school, law students represent individual families in the special education system. Most often, our clients are parents whose children have had some form of traumatic experience that is interfacing with the disabilities that qualify them for special education under state and federal law. The clinic's cases are our window into how the public education system is experienced by some of our most vulnerable children. Second, the non-lawyers in our project work directly in and with schools, providing professional development and technical um, assistance, helping educators understand how they can create safe and supportive learning environments as a foundation to support the learning of all students, including those who have been impacted by trauma. Finally, we use everything that we learn from families and everything that we learn from educators to advocate for policy solutions that effectively address the needs of both groups. This involves advocacy in the legislative arena in which we are increasingly better at helping our students learn how to play a pivotal role and also advocating with our state administrative agencies. So briefly, that's who we are and what we do. Next, what I wanna do is summarize the five core ideas that we develop in our two primary publications, Helping Traumatized Children Learn, Volumes 1 and 2. The first core idea is that many students have had traumatic experiences. Now this might sound rather banal, but perhaps your jaws will drop as ours did when we first learned about the study I'm about to share with you. In 1998, Vincent Felitti of the Kaiser Permanente Health System in San Diego and Rob Anda of the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta issued the first report in a groundbreaking study they did called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. What they did was ask 17,000 members approximately of the Kaiser HMO about adults, about experiences they had had as children. They asked them not about normative, developmentally normative experiences like losing a pet or failing a test. They asked them about the things on this slide. Three forms of childhood abuse and four forms of what they called household dysfunction. What they found were staggering rates of exposure to these experiences. Over a quarter of the adults in this sample said that they had experienced physical abuse as a child. A fifth, 20%, said that they had experienced sexual abuse. Altogether, 50.5, half of the people, a percent, half of the people in the sample had experienced at least one of the seven things on the slide. As staggering as that is, consider in addition the fact that 70% of the sample were white and 70% of the sample were college educated. This happens in every community. The investigators went on to document the consequences of these experiences for health outcomes across the life course. But of course, what we were interested in learning about um, was whether these experiences could be playing a role in the difficulties that our clients were experiencing in school. We scoured the medical journals, all the while representing individual kids in special education cases, and ultimately arrived at the answer to that question, our second core idea. Trauma can impact learning, behavior, and relationships in school. 
Now, the first important thing that we learned was that trauma is not the adverse childhood experience itself. It's not the event. Rather, trauma is a complex response to adversity that can result when one or more experiences are either so severe or so chronic that they fundamentally overwhelm a person's ability to cope and feel safe. What we wanted to know is, what does this response look like when a child who's been traumatized walks into the front door of a school in the morning? Fortunately, because of advances in uh, brain science, largely, the researchers are able to answer that question for us. And what they told us is that many of the fundamental skills and cognitive processes that underlie academic learning can be impacted by trauma. Likewise, um, a series of behaviors that can, be, uh, can very much get in the way of a child's success at school can result. And unsurprisingly, when our relationships with our primary caregivers have been disrupted, it's not hard to imagine that our ability to form relationships with adults and peers at school might also be impacted. These difficulties are at the core of a misunderstanding that can happen at school, where adults perceive as unmotivated or um, disruptive or unintelligent or just plain bad children who, in fact, are highly traumatized. These first two ideas, the prevalence of traumatic experience and its impact at school, are what we define as the public policy problem that we're trying to address. But what is our proposed solution? The third core idea, trauma-sensitive schools can help students feel safe so that they can learn. The way a child's community responds when he or she has experienced adversity, when he or she is hurt, plays a significant role in determining the severity of his or her trauma response. If schools become communities that are trauma sensitive, they can help buffer the impact of trauma. Here's our definition of a trauma sensitive school. A school in which all students feel safe, welcomed, and supported, and where addressing trauma's impact on learning is at the center of its educational mission. The definition is helpful, but we need to drill deeper. After almost a decade of working in schools, we've learned that there are six observable attributes that characterize a school that meets this definition. We're about to embark on a demonstration project with the American Institutes for Research in which we'll seek to document through both qualitative and quantitative measures the transformation in school culture that takes place as four to five schools here in Massachusetts work to become trauma sensitive and to embody these six attributes. So we have a problem and a solution, trauma sensitive schools, but we don't yet have a theory of action. Core ideas number four and five are about how we're going to get there. How do we get trauma sensitive schools to happen? Idea four is about a theory of action at the individual school level. Trauma sensitivity requires a whole school effort. This isn't about individual programs or interventions for identified kids, although services will be important. It's about changing the whole culture and operation of an organization, a school. Again, what we've learned directly from educators is that to take on the task of transforming a school's culture, they need a structural framework to help them weave trauma sensitivity throughout all the operations of a school. This is what we call the flexible framework. Six important operational functions that are the scaffold on which every school runs. In order to create a trauma sensitive whole school culture, educators need to think and plan how to infuse trauma sensitivity into each of these functions. Now, just naming this structure for educators, so we're told, helps bring down to earth and make manageable a task, transforming your culture, that can feel very distant and amorphous. Action planning using the framework is a big part of how we get there at the school level. But what about the larger system that surrounds schools? Core idea number five, helping traumatized children learn should become a major focus of education reform. The question we ask ourselves over and over is, what role can law and policy play in setting the conditions for good holistic practice? The wording of this question is very important. 
It's about law and policy setting the conditions. Now, in law, it seems like often, or at least in education reform, we try to close down the free-for-all and make it highly regulated. But what we've learned is that you can't mandate trauma sensitivity for schools. You can't legislate the urgency that educators must feel as the starting point for any effective transformation of a school culture. Um, many educators tell us that they badly want to make trauma sensitivity a priority, but law and regulations are getting in their way. To the extent school climate and culture initiatives are prioritized in contemporary um, education reform, they're often partial program-based initiatives siloed from each other and uncoordinated. Initiatives like those on this diagram are distinct balls that educators are forced to juggle, the legislature tossing one or two more at them each and every year. This is untenable and it feels overwhelming to educators. Ask any superintendent or principal and they'll tell you. Enter the flexible framework. If laws and policies are organized according to the core operational functions of schools, there's a structure in place that helps educators see how the core tasks involved in each of these initiatives are strikingly similar. There's a common foundation that underlies all of these things on the slide. If kids are getting bullied, for example, they are more likely to drop out of school. Therefore, dropout prevention must include bullying prevention. We can't continue to implement these initiatives in disconnected ways, and the framework helps us see the foundation that connects them all. Over the last decade, our clinic has advocated to have statewide school climate and culture initiatives organized according to the six elements of the framework. Those balls that are in black circles at the top um, are laws that our legislature has passed that incorporate these six elements. The four balls that are colored in but without the black circle that are the second layer are policies or regulations that our State Department of Education has organized according to the six elements of the framework. And those circles at the bottom are just a sampling of the district level plans or policies that have been organized according to the framework. Now, the pièce de résistance, the circle drawing them all together, was until last year a, a figment of our wildest hopes a statewide safe and supportive schools framework to create an infrastructure and align all of these initiatives. But on August 13th of last year, Governor Patrick signed into law the safe and supportive schools law, a bill for which we and our law students had been zealously advocating. This was incorporated by Speaker Bob DeLeo in his um, act to reduce gun violence that you probably read about in the papers last summer. So to conclude, what does this new law do? It defines a safe and supportive school as, among other things, a school that aligns all of these initiatives. It establishes a statewide safe and supportive schools framework and an online self-assessment tool that any school can use to help it create an action plan to become safe and supportive. And here's really, I think, the big thing. It grants power to school committees um, to require their schools to use the framework and self-assessment tool and then place their resulting action plans in their statutorily required school improvement plans, right alongside the plans for increasing academic achievement. It says, in effect, you can make creating a safe and supportive school environment just as important as getting those standardized test scores up. This is an experiment, to be sure, and we have a lot more to learn, but our hope is that this law begins to set the conditions so that when a school desires to become trauma sensitive, there's a coherent structure in place to support it to do so, rather than the school having to juggle trauma sensitivity as just one more of the many balls in the air. So, those are our five ideas. That's our website for those who are interested in learning more. Thank you.